Hey, Tom Sharpling here, the host of The Best Show. And if you've never heard of The Best Show before, everything you need to know is right there in the title. Each week we put on the best live podcast you're ever going to hear, featuring live callers, celebrity guests, music, plenty of surprises. Who knows what's going to happen? Last month alone we were joined by Conan O'Brien, Patricia Arquette, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, Nathan Fielder, Sunan Archives, John Oliver. The list goes on and on. So what are you waiting for? Join us live every Tuesday night on Twitch at 6 p.m. Pacific time and find us the next day on the Forever Dog Podcast Network and wherever you find podcasts. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. This episode contains explicit language. Welcome to Mom and Dad Are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast for Monday, June the 5th, the Daily Dad edition. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the homeschool and family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 11, Oliver, who's 9, and Teddy, who's 6. We live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm Zach Rosen. I make another show. It's called the Best Advice Show Podcast. And I'm dad to Noah, who's 5, and Ami, who's 2. We live in Detroit. I'm Jamila Lemieux. I'm a writer and contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column. I'm mom to Naima, who is 10, and we live in L.A. Today on the show, Zach is going to talk to Ryan Holiday, the author and host of The Daily Stoic. He has a new book out called The Daily Dad, 366 Meditations on Parenting, Love, and Raising Great Kids. After that interview, we're going to be back with recommendations and advice from you. All of that after this quick break. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lene Vanee. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. And the first step in making meaningful change is talking about the really hard things. Did you know that LGBTQ young people are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers? Macy's and The Trevor Project are on a mission to change that. The Trevor Project is the leading organization doing crisis intervention and mental health work for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning young people. My name is Sophie Good. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior corporate partnerships manager at The Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is a suicide prevention organization. The work that we do is very serious and it's very urgent. As much as we see a bright future and see the opportunities to make change, we know that LGBTQ young people are in pain and in danger right now. And support from Macy's empowers us. We've expanded our crisis services from just having the phone line to also having 24-7 service on text and chat. We've increased our lineup of suicide prevention programming as well. Working towards the world we want to create and making sure that we're showing up for young people in this moment is so important. Now's the time to help LGBTQ young people in crisis. This June, Pride Month, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund the Trevor Project's comprehensive approach to suicide prevention among LGBTQ young people. Find out how Macy's is creating brighter futures for all at Macy's.com slash purpose. I thought I knew a lot about my dad's childhood in Northwest Detroit. But it wasn't until I sat down with him a few years ago that I learned a bunch of details about how intense his childhood was. This year is going by so fast. Father's Day is coming up. Give him a unique, heartfelt gift that'll truly make him feel special and loved. The gift of StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. Every week, StoryWorth will email your loved one a thought-provoking question of your choice from their vast pool of options. These are questions you may never have had the chance to ask. Like, what's the bravest thing you've ever done in your life? Or, if you could see into the future, what would you want to find out? Last year, I gifted my dad story worth for Father's Day, meaning we are now just getting ready to publish that book, which I am planning to make copies of and give to my children. 
Give all the dads in your life a unique, meaningful gift you'll cherish for years. StoryWorth. Right now, for a limited time, you'll save $10 off your first purchase when you go to storyworth.com slash mom and dad. That's S-T-O-R-Y-W-O-R-T-H dot com slash mom and dad to save $10 on your first purchase. Storyworth.com slash mom and dad. We're back and I'm going to pass things over to you, Zach. What are we about to hear? This is an interview I did recently with the prolific author Ryan Holiday. He writes a lot about stoicism and has kind of brought stoic thought back into kind of popular culture. He's an amazing researcher. So he's he's read everything, you know, from like Marcus Aurelius to Seneca. But um, he's also a dad. He's got two kids. And for the last couple of years, he's been putting out this daily newsletter, which I follow. It's called The Daily Dad. And each one is just like a couple paragraphs, often quoting some sage wisdom from 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 Stoics, but also from like, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth II or Bruce Springsteen or Toni Morrison or Teddy Roosevelt. I really enjoyed talking to him. Here is my conversation with Ryan Holiday. I wanted to start with this beautiful image that you put in the beginning of your book. You wrote that one of the oldest pieces of evidence of humans in America is the footprints of a parent, probably a mother, walking in what is now White Sands National Park carrying and then setting down, carrying and then setting down, carrying and then setting down a young child. How did you discover this this uh, piece of evidence of us? I think I was reading a New York Times piece about the discovery of these footprints. We, we've understood that man was in North America roughly 10,000 years ago, and then it was pushed back to like 15,000 years. And then these, these footprints push it back closer to 20,000 years, which sort of upends a lot of understanding of how long people have really been here. And they were thinking about it, you know, purely from a sort of anthropological standpoint, just, hey, humans were here. What so struck me about reading the description was that it was the footprints of a of a parent and a child. So there's adult footprints and kids' footprints, but that the kids' footprints are intermittent, right? So they're not walking side mm-hmm. by side. Um, they're walking ex- exactly as my walk yesterday morning with my three-year-old went, which is we got to the end of the driveway and then I'm tired of walking. I'm tired of walking. Carry me. And then I, I carried him for a little while. And then his brother was doing something fun. And then he asked to be put down and he ran for, you know, a couple hundred yards and then asked to be picked up again. And it just, I think what struck me about it is, is that here you have human beings so long ago that also alongside their footprints are like giant sloths and all these other prehistoric yeah. uh, creatures. And at the same time, the experience of going uh, for a walk with your child is fundamentally unchanged through all of these centuries. That's the journey that we're on. So I I don't know, when I read it, I felt this sort of sense of kinship and and just a reminder that like people have been doing this for a very, very, very long time and more about it has stayed the same than has changed. What do you think it does for for you as a parent to, to think of yourself in a lineage of thousands of generations of, of parents carrying our kids? Well, I think a couple of things. So number one is like, obviously people have been doing this for a while and they've figured a few things out, right? And that we should try to learn what those things are. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like obviously all parents learn by experience. And, you know, if you're an oldest child, your experience is different than your younger siblings or vice versa. But like the costs of that education are externalized onto the children, right? So ideally, a lot of this we should try to learn by the experiences of others. So that's like the first thing that I take. The second thing I take, and I I took this during the pandemic, certainly, is this idea that we come from a long line of people who made it to the other side. There's this great Mm. letter that James Baldwin wrote to his nephew or something. And he goes, you know, you come from sturdy peasant stock. He's like, you come from the people that built the railroads and try, you know, he's just sort of going like, hey, like, however crazy you think living in, you know, 2020s America is, you come from people who would be like, that's what you're worried about, you know, like, Mm -hmm. that's what you didn't think there was a light on the other side of the tunnel for like we've been through harder stuff than this right and that's definitely one of the things they take from that i guess the last thing is just kind of the timelessness of it all you reference so many generations past um parents um and just 
advice givers you referenced seneca and florence nightingale and queen elizabeth ii and marcus aurelius and james baldwin this is a research question like because i think people that listen to our show are very interested and in, in seeking out insight wherever we can find it to help us figure out our next step how do you go about like researching for parenting advice i i really just read widely like as a person i'm just interested in stuff and then whenever I'm reading, I tend to find stuff that helps me. Like one of the, one of my favorite stories in the book is this story about Ulysses S. Grant, where uh, this is before Grant is the Civil War hero. He's basically a struggling alcoholic, some suspect. He's sort of bounced out of the military. He's failed in business. Like life is just beating the crap out of this guy. And he's working mm -hmm. for his father in like a leather tannery, which is just one of the most disgusting jobs you could possibly have. And he would come home. And, you know, the second he would get through the door, his son would like square off to to fight him, like to 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 wrestle him. <laughs> and he would he and and he would sort of start taunting his father. And and you know, Grant would say, you know, I'm a man of peace, but I cannot stand being hectored by a man of your size. And then they would get on the floor <laughs> and he would wrestle until he let his son pin him. You know, his son's like 10 years old. He would let his son pin him uh, in this sort of faux wrestling match. And I just um, you know, I was reading about the Civil War as I was researching for something for one of my one of my history books, and and then you don't you don't tend to think of these people as parents, just like you, people that worry about their kids, people that wonder what their kids are doing, people that wonder if they're doing a good job. You don't think about any of that until all that history collapses. Not unlike that example we were talking about with in White Sands National Park. All the eons and space and culture and, you know, social hierarchy just disappears. And you're like, whoa, you know, you're just, whoa, that's, that's yeah. what this has always been and always will be. Do you find something's happening in the dynamic between you and your kids? You're engaged in a particular activity or in a certain type of mood that puts you into that, um, that kind of whoa reverie, something that like really gets you to stop and... Mm. say whoa like day to day yeah that's a that's a that's a good question i mean i th i think one of the things that that always makes me think that and that i can sort of go to on demand is if i think about this being over right like if i n not just like you know stokes talk about memento mori if you're sort of meditating on your mortality but you know one of the things that parenting is is a constant process of progressing forward right they're crawling, then walking, then running, then riding bicycles, and then driving a car, you know, they're always going. And, and so I was walking through my garage, and I was just looking at all the stuff in the garage. And I was like, this is a graveyard of like a life I don't have anymore. Like we have a single mm -hmm. stroller from when we had one kid, and then we have a double stroller. And now both of them are basically too big to be the stroller. And then we have, you know, the scooter. We we have the 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 chair that my wife sat in, you know, when she would nurse at night. That that basically the garage is a graveyard of like needs that we don't have anymore. And so mm -hmm. whenever I think about that, that like as crazy as this is or hard as a certain moment is, like actually it all has an expiration date in a in a positive way. I immediately get to a place where I'm like, oh, this is so great. I don't want this to end. And it's so easy to forget that there is the expiration date when we're caught up in the the daily. And you write about this, you know, just how the fuck am I doing dishes again? I just did the dishes. I just made a lunch. Yeah. I just did the laundry. I just put the kids to bed. How am I here one day later doing the same exact thing? So it's this thing yeah. of the inevitability of progress. But then we're caught in the never-ending circle too so could you talk about the the mandala and kind of the the inspiration you find from from that idea yeah there's that sort of buddhist form of art where they make these sand sculptures and they're painstaking they take forever and they're beautiful it's all these colored sand this colored sand and then at the end they they wipe it clean or they blow it off and they have to start over and it's this idea that the art is the doing of the thing and then this restarting of the thing is a sort of cycle and obviously having to do the dishes three times in one day or go school shopping when you just thought you went school shopping, you know, there is an exhaustion to it. You know, there's one um, 
place where you are, where you're frustrated about that and you complain about it, or you you try to make someone else do it, right? It's like, you do the dishes then. But realizing that it, that's what it is, that every day is, is this sort of self-contained thing, this opportunity to do those parenting things again, I've just found that to be kind of a reassuring way to think about it. The other way that I feel that for some reason, the growth struck me that that is also a one-way street, right? Like not only you, you only get to do it so many times, but like, you know, we see ourselves aging in the mirror and we go, oh, it's sad that, you know, I'm older, but we don't think again, that that is, that is heading towards a dead end. That is heading towards like the road stopping. So instead of going like, oh, I can't believe I have to uh, clip their nails again. This is like another annoying or gross thing to do. It just struck me as like, where did those two weeks go? You know, or where did that month go? Yeah. Do I actually have a month of memories or presence or, um, you know, experiences to show for it? Or did that just zip right by because I, I wasn't even in that sort of mandala phase, but I was more in the like just getting through the day phase. And there's something I think mm -hmm. tragic about that. How old are your kids? A six year old and a three year old. What I'm about in you? The same boat. I've got, I've got, so almost six and almost three yeah. yeah 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 we're in this period of constantly caring for our children cutting sure. their nails making meals giving 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 it seems very giving yeah. um but you write about um like florence nightingale and she's figured out a way to find inspiration from our kids like our, we sometimes forget like they give us so much too sure so what did what did florence nightingale figure out well, actually, I saw a better example of this. You know, Zelensky is now this sort of revered, incredible figure, right? He's the president of Ukraine. He's staring down an invasion. And I went back and I was reading his inauguration address, like before any of this happened. Hmm. And, you know, like in America, mm -hmm. you go to the airport or the DMV, there's like the president's picture there on the wall. And in, I guess they do this in yeah. Ukraine also. And he basically gave this speech and he was like, don't put my picture on the wall, like in your office or whatever. He's like, put a picture of your kids on the wall. And his point was that, like, yeah. it's not about looking up at, you know, these people and be like, I want to like do my country proud. He was like, just don't let your kids down. I think about that because, yeah, we, you know, we go make me proud out there to your kid as they trot out onto the soccer field or whatever. But I would suspect fewer of us ask ourselves, like, are we making our families proud? Are we making our kids proud? And that's a shame because here you actually have a person who for a brief period of time um, actually does think you're all these amazing, incredible things. And instead of sort of freezing that in your mind of the ideal of what you could be or the standard to live up to, we, we kind of just brush past that. Before you became a dad, did you have models, whether in your own life or from from culture that you looked at and said like oh i want to try to be like that i want to kind of evoke that kind of dead energy <laughs> less so than i maybe would have liked to have i think one of the weird things that changed me as a parent is like and this probably says something about my childhood but i don't have a, a ton of memories of me as a kid like if my therapist asked me to like do some inner child work, I, for some reason, I think of myself as like 13. I, I have trouble going like, what was a six-year-old like? Or, you know, what was I like as a three-year-old? I, my wife can remember when she was four or younger. And I, I, I don't really have a lot of memories of who I was when I was a kid. And so one of the things that's been really sort of eye-opening and expansive for me about parenting is like suddenly... I'm like, oh, wait, that's what a three-year-old is like? You know, that's what a two-year-old yeah. is like? Um, that's what a two-year-old who has some of my DNA is like? And that's really interesting. And then it's it's particularly interesting when you see your parents interact with a two-year-old, right? And you're like, some of those stories from my own childhood, now that I can contextualize what a two-year-old mm. is or isn't doing... I'm like, that wasn't okay, or that was fucking weird, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. what are you talking about? And then when you when you see how a kid interacts with their grandparents, it also gives you a sense of how you must have interacted with your parents. So I think one of the journeys I've been on is just kind of trying to understand like what a kid is and what they need. Um, and then what I must have needed and what I got in some ways and didn't get in other ways. Yeah, one of the big figures you write about is Seneca. And I loved yeah. the piece from April 22nd, 
called delay, delay, delay. This is something that I continue yes. to to struggle with. And sometimes I'm successful and often I'm not. Could you give us the, the lesson on delay from Seneca? Well, Seneca writes this uh, beautiful essay called On Anger. Um, we know that he had one child who died. We don't know if he had any other children. But then he has this unique role. He's he's brought back from exile to tutor this sort of problematic child. It's like 14 or 15 years old, who, who history knows as Nero. Um, so maybe Seneca does a bad job or maybe it was a lost cause. But Seneca thinks a lot about, you know, sort of guiding uh, a person in their development. And he writes these essays on it. And he basically says, like, you know, anger is the, the always makes things worse. You know, he says delay is the remedy of anger. But one of the things I have taken from his writing that I think about, uh, and I think delay brings this, when we think about delaying, it usually prevents this process from happening. But I don't recall really any time that I've ever lost my temper, least of all with my kids, where afterwards mm -hmm. I was like, good call. Like that was the right thing to do that ages well. Like it was definitely great that you got upset, right? There's maybe a few times in my life where, you know, getting angry was partly was inseparable from say standing up for myself or standing up for something that was right. But, but definitely mm -hmm. in like a, a, a marriage or a parenting capacity, I, I can't think of any instances where, I lost my temper and I'm I'm proud of that fact afterwards. And and realizing that that's where you're going to get, it doesn't always help, but it, it it has caught me more than one time from sort of fully spiraling in a in a direction that I know ultimately is not positive. And you go on to say like it's it's not like we should not hold our kids accountable. It's not like we shouldn't talk about what happened, yes. but just the mere act of just pausing for 5 seconds is a huge it's a huge um sign of 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 you know parental evolution i think yeah we're just as a as a person right i mean uh, but, yeah, but specifically as a, as a parent you know it's like i think just pausing in general is so great right it's like you know you learn this when they're really young they fall over so they're learning to walk and like your first instinct is like oh my god are you okay you must be so hurt you know because you don't want anything to happen to this little little infant and like 50, 60% of the time, they get up laughing, you know, like they're not actually hurt. And so you, you just realize that a lot of times you are bringing your emotions to the situation and then your kids are picking up that emotion. And so just generally delaying, like, hey, you don't have to have an opinion on this right now. Like, you can wait and talk about it later. Why don't we talk about this when we get home? We just got a new car recently. It's the most money we've ever spent on anything other than our house. Yeah. This is like two weeks ago. <laughs> I go to put Noah, my oldest daughter, in the car the other day, and I see there is the shape of a heart written in rock on the new black door. Ugh. Someone carved a heart with a rock yes. into our door. And I said, Noah, did you carve this heart into the new car door? She said, yeah. Like she just didn't know. Yes. Like all, we love, we love when she makes hearts. Yes, and I had to delay. Yeah, I was so happy that I did because I sometimes I don't. Yeah. I, I I don't always succeed. But in that moment, I was like, my daughter innocently carved a heart, a permanent heart into the door, and I am just going to love this, and this is going to be a an attribute of the car now. Well, it's funny because you know, like a decade from now five decades from now, this is going to be a beautiful, hilarious story that it captures the innocence and the sweetness. Yeah, I'll tell her that her bat mitzvah. Yeah, that captures the innocence and sweetness of, of childhood. And you would choose that story over a pristine, you know, used car that you've since gotten rid of any yeah. day. But yeah. in the moment, yeah. there is this instinct. I, I think our generation has it less so than our parents. But like, I just think about some of the things that my parents believed were very, very important that mm. are just clearly not important, right? Like how many conversations we had to have about eating in the backseat of the car, uh, you know, like, again, where are yeah. these cars, right? These cars are in squashed <laughs> right. in little cubes in junkyards now, right? Like whatever their, you know, their 1993, uh, Toyota Tacoma, like this isn't a prized possession that they've continued to use. Like it, it's gone like everything else. 
And I remember I was talking to a, a woman, I know she's 94, and she was saying that when she had mm. kids, people would come over to her house and they'd be like, it doesn't look like you have children, <laughs> right? And she was like, that was so important, right? That the house mm. looked like a house of normal people, not a house that little kids lived in. And she was like, totally. I just think back to how incredibly foolish and pointless all of that was, right? I imagine she was imagining the arg like that didn't just happen. That was a result of a lot of nagging and yelling and punishments and also mm -hmm. stress and anxiety and shame. Mm -hmm. um, with the passage of time, that all feels you know totally unnecessary and self inflicted and utterly meaningless. And so, Obviously, yeah, you got your kid has to learn that they can't just go scratching in the paint of, of your car because if they can do it to your car, they might accidentally do it to someone else's car or something. Like it's not great. Um, and there's a there's a financial cost to it. But I yeah. I walked through our garage and there was a day where somebody decided they should just draw on the side. Like there's this like mural, like not well done mural basically on the inside of the garage. And it's annoying and and weird, you know, and and I don't I, I think I'd like you stop myself from losing my temper as it happened. When we sell this house, that will be five minutes of work, you know, to paint right. over. Who cares? So, Ryan, before we go, can you just read this? There's a beautiful passage from the end of the book toward the end of the book. Um, can I just have you read that for us? Yeah, of course. Love can only exist in the present moment. Leo Tolstoy. Have you ever watched someone sit and play with a little kid for hours, like totally engrossed, never checking a phone, never rushing, never getting bored or frustrated, never pulling the adult card? When you see this sort of effortless presence and patience, it's humbling. It's an incredible feat of human endurance and focus, one that doesn't seem to come naturally to all of us. And that's the point. It doesn't come naturally. Like all other feats of endurance and skill, it takes works. You build the muscle before you can use it to move mountains or put a dozen toddlers to bed. But here's the real question. Are you actually putting in that kind of effort or are you just throwing up your hands and saying, that's not me, I can't do it? You would not be alone, but you also would not be more wrong. Try, try and start small. Leave your phone in the car when you come home. Play Legos for the next hour with no interruptions. Write the rest of the afternoon off. Put as much work into this parenting thing as you do for work. Try to be all in just for a bit, and you'll be amazed at how that time opens up and fills with what feels like a lifetime's worth of memories. That was Ryan Holiday and his book, The Daily Dad, 366 Meditations on Parenting, Love, and Raising Great Kids. All right, we're going to take another quick break, and we'll be back in a second. This episode is brought to you by KiwiCo. You guys know I love a good family moment, like my parents playing a trivia game with us and us all kind of laughing around the table, and I'm constantly chasing that feeling with my own family. We have found that with KiwiCo. So each month, KiwiCo delivers a crate packed with fun. It sparks creativity with kid-friendly topics and activities. Henry's last crate, he built a LED speaker box, so he did most of the work. Actually, he loves doing the engineering and tinkering kind of on his own. He plugged this in to one of our iPhones and we turned down the lights and it played music plus putting little lasers up on the ceiling. We had a great time. You guys, literally as soon as the project comes, the kids cannot wait to get started. Redefine learning with play. Explore hands-on projects that build creative confidence and problem-solving skills with KiwiCo. Get 50% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line at kiwico.com slash mom and dad. That's 50% off your first month at kiwico.com slash mom and dad. Priceline presents Go to Your Happy Price. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. You can see yourself already there. It's beautiful. It might be sunny and sandy for some, neon and urban for others, deserts or rainforests or hiking trails. With Priceline, you can get to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else. Like up to 60% off select hotels to Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to Priceline.com and travel to your happy place for a happy price. All right, see ya. I'm off to Miami. 
No, actually, wow, look at that. No, I I'm going to Hawaii now. Ooh, Cancun looks nice. You know what? Belize looks pretty nice this time of year. Or, mmm, Palm Springs. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Hey, Tom Sharpling here, the host of The Best Show. And if you've never heard of The Best Show before, everything you need to know is right there in the title. Each week we put on the best live podcast you're ever going to hear, featuring live callers, celebrity guests, music, plenty of surprises. Who knows what's going to happen? Last month alone we were joined by Conan O'Brien, Patricia Arquette, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, Nathan Fielder, Sunan Archives, John Oliver. The list goes on and on. So what are you waiting for? Join us live every Tuesday night on Twitch at 6 p.m. Pacific time and find us the next day on the Forever Dog Podcast Network and wherever you find podcasts. Let's move on to recommendations. Jamila, what are you recommending? Okay, I've got another recipe. It's very simple. It's banana pudding. Don't know if it's something you all grew up eating, but it was one of my favorite desserts as a child and something mm. I just made for Naima for the first time. It's super simple. Get a small box and a large box of pudding mix, a standard size box of vanilla wafers or store brand wafers, three to four bananas. You'll need milk for the pudding mix. You make the pudding, you layer in cookies, then pudding, then bananas, then cookies, then pudding, then banana, and you keep doing that, and you end with a layer of cookies on top. Pop, put a little butter on the top, just a little bit. Pop it in the oven for about 15 to 20 minutes, and it's one of the most indulgent, yummy desserts that you can have. It's definitely a dessert from my childhood, and I was wondering if the vanilla wafers would be in there, because I think without it, what's the point? What's the point? I have had it with Pepper's Farm chessmen cookies, Ooh, I don't mind uh, that. which is really good, too. Um, uh, yes. Is that, yeah. Do you think that enhances it? Is that like the upgrade? I, I think it is somewhat of an upgrade, you know, even though I still love the vanilla wafers, I always go for the, the vanilla wafers, but I had a right. friend who her signature was banana pudding, and she made a really rich and really indulgent, I can't remember if there was like cream cheese in her or something, or maybe <laughs> evaporated milk, but like she used, um, yep. <laughs> she didn't use box pudding, she did like a homemade pudding and oh, yeah. chestnut cookies, and it was really good. I love That's cold pudding in the summer, too. Mm -hmm. Sounds delish. Zach, what are you recommending? So of all the toys we have actually purchased for the kids, which actually hasn't been that much, we've gotten a lot of hand-me-downs, but something that I feel was totally worth the investment was magnetiles. And everyone yes. knows what magnetiles are. Mm -hmm. I love magnetiles. My kids love magnetiles. And I just recently discovered that um, depending on the, the innards of your house, a lot of corners like where where walls meet at the corner um a lot of them have this thing i think it's called a corner bead that is yeah. actually magnetic and so you can take your magnetiles off the floor and start building upward on the wall um my mom's friend marcy just recommended this to me a couple weeks ago and it it's breathed new life into our our magnetile practice so um super fun too and i think the kids will totally at least at first see the novelty of it and remember that magnetiles if they are if they've kind of turned away from magnetiles that oh here's a whole new use for them so use your magnetiles on your most likely magnetic walls and uh front doors are usually magnetic mm. radiators and my absolute favorite is your garage door if you have a garage okay. door it's magnetic and you can take them outside on a sunny day and uh put them out and it's Love that. We had Love old that. school radiators in um, part of our Dutch house, and they those were like perfect. <laughs> they they won't melt the magnetile. I mean, we didn't leave them up there. I okay. don't know. We never had any. We never had any melting incident. Good. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yes. I think cool. it had like that grate on it. You know, like a yeah. like a metal grate around mm -hmm. it. Um, Magnetiles are one of the few toys we have, like, had since the beginning. And in cleaning out the toys, it's the thing the kids asked, like, Legos and Magnetiles and a Marble Run to come to Japan. There it is. So. And they're, like, indestructible. They're amazing. They're, they're so good. I just think they're, like, the, such a fun toy. All-time toy. ATG. Um, 
I'm recommending something that I think I recommend about this time every year, but it's just that good. These are the Summer Brain Quest books and cards, and they have just celebrated their 30th um, anniversary and actually sent me like advanced copies of their summer, their new books and their new summer books because they had not been updated for a while. And the updates are great, guys. Mm. I mean, I am such a huge fan of the summer books in particular because they're really digestible and they have this little map that the kids get to put stickers on. My kids don't, we don't do a ton of workbooks, um, but these they find really fun. They're perfect for like bringing on the plane or in the car. Like if you just need something for your kids to do and sit at the table while you're making lunch or dinner, they can do a couple pages of these. I find the work to be really digestible. So the kids don't really fight me on it. It's a lot of their summer books like bridge to grades. And so they're getting some stuff that they did and mm. being introduced to a couple of new things. Uh, and I just think they're they're a nice way to do that over the summer. They've also redone their larger grade specific books to include these roadmaps in the younger ages and a new list of books in the back. Um, I just think they're they're they are what we have relied on most summers as just something to bring along so that we're getting a little bit of academics and something they can do quietly. Uh, and we've always really loved them and the updates are great. They also make these cards that like fan out and are, and are questions. I used to do them when I was little. And so we love those for particularly all the meals on our trip that were kind of long and parents can ask the questions. Um, we all find it fun to like do Teddy's first grade ones to get <laughs> together. Uh, and at the sixth grade level, there's a couple questions that I couldn't answer, you know, <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah. oh, wait, I've like totally forgotten some of the, the memorized knowledge, which the kids always find fun. So you can check out the Summer Brain Quest books and cards. Brain Quest has been killing it since I was a kid. It's so fun. Well, we're finally going to dive into our mailbag and read the advice that you send our way. Our first letter is all about the Tooth Fairy episode we did a few weeks back with Slate's Willa Paskin. Hi, I appreciated the Tooth Fairy discussion. It was something I was ambivalent about, but my daughter developed a strong interest in on her own as she got closer to losing her teeth. I had my own worries about using money. I could never be certain to actually have cash in the house at all times. And I was also concerned that I would get caught trying to put anything under her pillow. Our solution? She leaves her tooth in a special ring box on her windowsill, and in exchange for the tooth, the Tooth Fairy leaves a chocolate coin or two. One bag of chocolate coins hidden on a high closet shelf will probably last me the entire time the Tooth Fairy is around, and it still plays into the money lore. And our own lore is that the Tooth Fairy's incentive for this payment is to get more sugar on kids' teeth. Wins all around. I like that. It's kind of uh, a little more pure than money for some reason. I think it's fun. One all bag of chocolate. Iterations. And yeah, what a fun, what a fun thing. So many of you wrote in about Maribel's sock recommendation, but here are two letters. I use binder clips to clip a small laundry bag to my kid's hamper. That way I can throw in any of those small items, socks, bibs, reusable breastfeeding pads, small washcloths. And honestly, the only time I lose socks is outside of laundry, like at daycare or in the car. Maribel speculated about this, but those Delicates laundry bags has been my solution for kids' socks for years. Each child has their own bag in their hamper, and they're responsible for putting their socks in their bag. And when we do laundry, we just zip up the bag, throw it in the washer or the dryer, and then each kid takes their bag and matches their own socks. Listeners, you guys are so smart i love all these like (laughs) like quick tips this is something we have not done in our house like the the sock thing i just sort of try to manage it but i think i might try some of these yeah i had never heard of it until Lottie bell um told me about it it's really such an efficient idea well thank you all for writing in if you're out there listening and have any thoughts advice or questions of your own send it in you can email us at mom and dad at slate.com or leave us a voicemail at 646-357-9318. And that's our show. Please subscribe to our show, leave a rating and review, and of course, tell your friends. This episode of Mom and Dad Are Fighting is produced by Rosemary Belson and Maura Curry. Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. For Jamila Lemieux and Zach Rosen, I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. Thanks for listening. Hey, Tom Sharpling here, the host of The Best Show. And if you've never heard of The Best Show before, everything you need to know is right there in the title. Each week we put on the best live podcast you're ever going to hear, featuring live callers, celebrity guests, 
music, plenty of surprises. Who knows what's going to happen? Last month alone, we were joined by Conan O'Brien, Patricia Arquette, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, Nathan Fielder, Sunan Archives, John Oliver. The list goes on and on. So what are you waiting for? Join us live every Tuesday night on Twitch at 6 p.m. Pacific time and find us the next day on the Forever Dog Podcast Network and wherever you find podcasts.